Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today at Restoration Life on our YouTube channel. We hope and pray that this message blesses you, encourages you, and maybe even challenges you a little bit. Take a listen. Bibles, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, I'm going to catch up real quick. Uh, we've been in this um, symptoms of a spiritual stroke, um, piggybacking off a realm uh, for a couple weeks now, and I just feel in my heart. You know, just to let you know up front right now, next week, um, we're going to talk about another symptom, and I'm going to call it the symptom the symptom of comparison. And so we're going to dive a little bit deep in that because you you wouldn't realize how much you and I um, compare ourselves to things that are unhealthy. And if we're not careful, that, that unhealthy comparison um, can cause you to think things or do things that you shouldn't be doing. You know, like, like you know, the grass is greener on the other side, you know, and like water your grass and it'll be green too, you know. So there's just a lot of things that we need to unpack biblically um, to help us understand that we're not created to be a carbon copy of somebody else, but that we've been uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully made by our creator uh, to live in his image. And so we, we're going to look at comparisons next Sunday. But today I want to just kind of finish this idea of um, the symptom of confusion. And um, how, is this helping anybody? At all, because um, if you're not careful, you could find yourself in a really bad place because of confusion. And the Bible teaches us this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces and even uh, of evil in the heavenly realms. And we talked about how you and I function in and out of two different realms, the realm of the flesh the realm of the spirit. The realm of the spirit is the realm that um, that we function in as Christians that are being led by the Holy Spirit, found um, in God's truth through his word. And that's where we need to all live as much as we can, while at the same time understanding that we're all flesh and blood and we do live in the natural realm. And the natural realm that we function in, our flesh and blood, thrives in wanting to do everything that's opposite of God. And so it, it is somewhat of a tug of war um, sometimes. But if you can learn how to live in the spirit and you can learn how to live in obedience to God's word, you'll find that living spiritually is a lot easier than you actually think. And so we want to continue um, series responding to my voice right now. Um, we want to continue in this, this thought. Romans 8, 8 says this. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. Come on, let's dedicate this to the Lord. Bow our head, close our eyes in reverence to God. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We know that it's alive, that it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you open our hearts and minds to truth. Because it's your truth that sets us free this morning. And so, Father, we thank you for the assembling of the body of Christ, the saints, your church, your bride. Pray that your Holy Spirit have dominion as we make room for you to move. We surrender to truth this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody made a loud voice, a loud noise and said, Amen. Come on. Can we just, can we just thank God for, for life today? Huh. So quickly, we, we talked about a spirit of confusion that we all deal with. And um, if we're not careful, it can create some really bad things in our lives. And one of the main scriptures that we brought out had to do with 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 10, verse 3 and 5, where he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war um, according or after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're what? Mighty uh, in pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought into obedience to Christ. We have the strength, we have the authority, um, we have the disposition to be able to bring every thought captive and make it obedient to God. Um, our thoughts don't rule us, we rule our thoughts, right? They are obedient to the Spirit of God living within us, and it's important for us that as we continue to walk out this walk of faith, we know that it's a journey. Uh, we can't wait to get to the destination, but we understand it is a journey. And in the midst of this journey, we understand that there are a lot of things that you and I are going to have to deal with as human beings that live in the world but are not of the world. And we're in constant submission to the Spirit of God 
as he leads us and guides us. So confusion literally means a lack of understanding of uncertainty. And we know what we believe. We are certain about what we believe and who we believe in. And so the enemy would have you confused uh, in order to derail uh, your future in Christ Jesus. So we talked a little bit about that last week, about the spirit of confusion and um we need to deal with it because if we don't deal with it, um, there's a lot of harm that can come from living a life that's confused, not understanding what to do or how to go about making good decisions versus making bad decisions. It's not because you don't know what you're supposed to do. Most often we know what we're supposed to do, but our flesh desires something else. Come on. Your flesh wants to be fed constantly. That's what fasting is really all about. Fasting isn't for you to come into this spiritual weight loss system. Um, fasting really is to cause your flesh to submit to your spirit and to position your faith in a place where you can hear God more clearly instead of the desires of your flesh. And so that was the first thing that we talked about last week is the spirit of flesh. Oh, I'm sorry, the spirit of, uh, uh, of confusion. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's another problem. <laughs> uh, Second thing, second thing that I want to think about confusion is confusion derails our pursuit of Jesus. Confusion derails our, confu- our, 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 I'm sorry. Confusion derails our pursuit of Jesus. I know God saved me and I know that God set me free from the life that I once lived. And I know that God healed me of all my brokenness and I know God restored me into a right relationship. So that I could just attend church? No, because he's got this beautiful plan uh, in store for me and my family and my children and my children's children. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 reminds us, for we are God's masterpiece. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him you're a masterpiece. Come on, this is going to help somebody feel good this morning. Look at at somebody and tell him, you are God's masterpiece. Come on, there's no one like you. You're priceless. You're unique. We celebrate your uniqueness because you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the creator of the almighty God. And so we celebrate your life today because we know there is no one like you. God broke the mold when he made you. You are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. I've been made brand new. Does that make anybody feel good today? That I've been made brand new. I know I feel old, but today I am brand new in Christ Jesus. So that, listen, listen for the, one of the reasons why you've been made brand new. So that you can do good things. You can do the good things that he planned for us long ago to do. If you've been to Restoration Life for any period of time, you'll know that we believe that everybody plays a part in the body of Christ. That we believe that every single member of this body, every single family, every single crying baby, and don't worry, that's okay, we love them. That every person in this church is valuable to the kingdom of God. That you are an essential part of the body of Christ. That you don't go to church, that you are the church. Right? And so the church um, functions at full strength when you are actively involved in participating in the vision of the house that God has called our church to accomplish. And so you're not worthless. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what social media says. You are not worthless. You are a masterpiece. You are born again. You've been forgiven of all your sin. And you've been empowered by the same resurrection power that Christ, that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That same power dwells in each and every single one of us. It's not from us, but it flows through us. And we need to understand this because a lot of people come, come to church and they feel messed up and broken and jacked up. And I'm talking about believers. And I'm not saying that you won't go through stuff in life. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. But I, what I'm saying to you is that you shouldn't live there for the rest of your life, right? You're not subject to the lies and the confusion 
that you once lived in. You are God's masterpiece. You've been empowered and God is in you and flowing through you. And he saved you with a purpose. And it's divine. It's divine. It's not for the world. But it's for those that don't know Jesus as of yet. You are not powerless. In fact, let me remind you that you are full of power. Because God lives in you. God lives in you. And if you'll surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit, he can flow through you. You can experience that goodness. and You can experience that grace. In fact, all the gifts that we've been given have been grace gifts to expand his kingdom. And his kingdom is made up of people. And that's who we are together. So please don't, don't declare the lies of the enemy of your life. Declare the promises of God's truth over your life. Again, you are God's masterpiece and you are rare. Amen. Some of you are medium rare. Hallelujah. A holy people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And this is who we are in Christ. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor, it's not in vain. So we understand that through Christ, uh, we've been saved and we've been born again and we've been given this new life. But in this new life, we've been given a task or a mandate or a job to accomplish through our life as believers in Christ. But here's the problem. During this spiritual attack of confusion, this, this spirit of confusion is constantly at work at redirecting God's future for your life. He wants to change the trajectory of your future. And I know God is sovereign. And I know that whatever God sent his word out to accomplish, it, it'll be fulfilled. But here's the reality. A lot of times we can find our... Has anybody ever been lost in route to somewhere? I mean, has... I mean, come on. Has, has Google Maps ever, like, just taken you somewhere you're not supposed to go? I mean... A lot of times we, we get sidetracked. We're looking at the map. We, we believe that we're going to the right place. We go to the wrong place. We, we, we put in one thing and there's like 15 of them in the same city. And it takes us to somewhere else we're not supposed to go. So it's important to know that if he just sidetracks you, he can delay the call of God on you. He can delay the, the fulfillment of God's calling on your life just by being sidetracked. So the Satan isn't always... Um, uh, worried about whether or not you go to church. He's worried more so if he can keep you sterile while in the church. Not doing anything. Not focused on God's call. Not focused on God's will. Not focused on God's purpose. And if he can derail you from that, if he can keep you from accomplishing that, if he can keep you from pursuing that, then many a times that's good enough. That's good enough to have a church filled with lukewarm people doing nothing. It's the reason why so many churches die. I mean, we are experiencing a catastrophic closure of churches around our nation because people aren't pursuing Jesus. They've been caught up with the spirit of confusion and they've just done things they're not supposed to do. And man's error is creeped into the house and the church starts to wither and die. Because discipleship isn't taking place. Because people aren't passionate about the things that God is passionate about. Because people aren't evangelizing and reaching more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they stopped believing in miracle signs and wonders. And they stopped laying hands. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that as long as you come to Restoration Life, at some point somebody's going to lay hands on you and believe God for you. At some point somebody's going to come alongside of you and come into agreement with you over the promises of God. At some point somebody's going to go, you're wrong for thinking the way that you think. You need to repent and get right with God and get right with your family and get right with the plan. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? We got to be real with ourselves because sometimes we allow the spirit of confusion to lead us to this and to lead us to that and to think this and to think that. How about going to God for the wisdom? How about going to the word of God for the direction? How about going to the people of God to make a deposit into you that's led by the Holy Spirit of God? Come on, we are a spirit-filled church with spirit-filled people. Come on, functioning in a spirit-filled way. Why, oh why, are you confused? Who 
Who's got you confused? What's got you confused? Because during a spiritual attack like this, the spirit of confusion wants to hinder you from accomplishing the task that God has for your life. Wants to detour you from your purpose. He wants to remove you from your office. He wants to disqualify you from the anointing. And he wants to crush you in your faith. This is the enemy at work. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 reminds us. Let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season. I feel like our church is in due season. We will reap if we do not give up. Look at somebody tell them don't give up. Come on, don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on your marriage. Hello, somebody. Don't give up on the dreams and the visions that God has planted in your heart. Don't give up on the call of God on your lives. Don't give up on staying both physically and spiritually healthy. Don't give up on being obedient to God. Don't give up on being sacrificial with Christ. Don't give up on Jesus. If you're going to give up on anything, give up on giving up. Give up on listening to the lies of the enemy. Come on, give up on the passions and desires of this world. Give up on living in confusion. Give up on living sick and tired of being sick and tired. Give up on being the one that's cost, constantly causing drama for everybody. Give up on staying lukewarm. Or worm. Warm. Help us, Jesus. Lukewarm. <laughs> Man. Confusion. Confusion is brutal. Third thing, confusion causes fear. It births fear. The enemy bombards the mind with various thoughts and ongoing temptation in order to rob you. Of God's peace and what you're doing for him. You know that that as you pursue the will of God, as you pursue the plan of God, as you pursue the call of God, as you pursue the restoration of God over your life. Do you know that in the midst of all that junk, you could experience the peace of God? You could experience the peace of God. It's the reason why Paul the Apostle can go to jail and feel the peace of God on him. He's pursuing the call of God. He's pursuing the will of God. He's pursuing God's calling over his life and all the assault, all the attack, all the junk that comes with it. You can have peace in the midst of it. You can have peace in the midst of it. So you can still go through stuff and not give up on God because you got the peace of God that rules and reigns in your life. How many know that that a lot of times, in fact, most times pursuing God's will isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's not just going to be, it's not just going to be like, here, just have fun. Enjoy the rest of your life. Kumbaya, I'll see you in heaven. It comes with struggles. It comes with battles. It comes with temptations and hardships. It comes with life issues. And, and in the midst of all that garbage, you can still pursue the call of God and find the peace of God in the middle of all that. Because we serve a good God. The mind becomes irritated and exhausted when it's confused. Anybody been there? Some of you woke up just irritated. Just irritated. Good morning. <laughs> I don't see anything good about it. You ever talk to somebody who's irritated? Their mind is exhausted. They're just exhausted, man. Because that's what confusion does. Satan does all he can to bring about mental fatigue. And a lot of us have found ourselves there because we work hard. Come on, we live in Cali. We work hard to live in the South Bay. It's no joke. No joke living out here. And I know a lot of you are like, man, I can, I can move to Montana. You could. Then you'd have Montana weather. <laughs> be watchful. Don't be ignorant of the symptoms. The spiritual stroke is drawing nearer and nearer when your mind, 
um, succumbs to the assault of mental fatigue brought about by confusion. In fact, I've often noticed that you can get really sluggish and tired, even though you've had a whole night of sleep, you can wake up sluggish and tired because your mind is fatigued with all the stuff that is constantly being thrown at it. You're bombarded by the cares of the world, by the things that that are constantly trying to distract you from having a beautiful relationship with God the Father. And, And what ends up happening is that your mind becomes mentally fatigued and you become irritable. You become irritable and you start saying things and doing things that really isn't a part of your character and your personality because you're tired and you're exhausted. Anybody ever been just spiritually exhausted? Just spiritually just fatigued? Like I'm just tired and that's when the enemy loves to strike. And when it's time to make a decision, you don't know how to make a good decision because all you want is out of the struggle. All you want is you want to go from A to B, from sickness to healing, from brokenness to restoration. And sometimes there's a process to that. And a lot of times our minds and our hearts and our emotions are so caught up that we can't we can't experience that in the time frame that we desire. Like I wanted it two weeks ago. God says you'll get it six months from now. It's interesting when God says in Jeremiah, through Jeremiah the prophet, to the children of Israel, he says, Behold, chapter 29, verse 11 through 14, one of my life scriptures, right? Behold, I've got great plans for your life. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And when we read that just for that, it's like, yeah, that's for me. A tattoo it right there. I can see it every day. But what you fail to do is read it in context because they're living in slavery in Babylon. And they'll be there for the next 70 years. But God says, behold, I've got plans for you. So my time frame isn't the same as God's. I want my microwave healing. You know what I'm saying? Forget the popcorn, put a button for healing. Right? Is anybody with me? Like, empty on gas again? Well, how did that happen? It hasn't even been four days and I'm empty. Another $80. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Life gets right. You go to the grocery store, $100 and then fill up one of the little baskets. Is anybody with? Like, before 150 bucks, full basket. Pushing it out. Can it help you? Absolutely to the car. Now a hundred bucks. How much was this? What did I buy? It's like bread and bologna. What did, Juanita's burritos, frozen burritos. I mean, why, why is it a hundred dollars? Does anybody feel like this when you go to the grocery store now? It's like, how much are diapers? Come on, how much is Similac? Can't you just breastfeed him till he's six? I mean, I just. It's, gr- it's gross, right? It's time fatigue. And what happens is we get so caught up with the cares of this world, we start taking our eyes off of our assignment. And we start putting it on all the bad things. And I say, God, what are you going to do? So when are you going to respond? When are you going to come to my rescue? When are you going to do this? And God's like, I've already rescued you from sin. I've already empowered you to do, to do the good things that I had planned for you long ago to do. Why are you being all caught up with all this other stuff? Am I not Jehovah Jireh? Am I not your provider? Am I not Jehovah Shalom, your peace? Am I not Jehovah peace? I mean, wh- why are you casting off all your cares to the world, you should cast them to me. We believe that every believer is born again with a purpose. James 1 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, but for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those 
who love him. Romans 8, 28 says, for, for all things, say all things, all things work out for the good to those who love God and are called, and are called, and are called according to his purpose. And so let me remind you, you're all called for his purpose. And whatever it is that has you confused, man, give it to Jesus. Because it's all going to work out. It's all going to work out. He promises that all those who are called and love him, everything's going to work out according to his purpose. But in the midst of the attack and the overwhelming thoughts and desires, we, we tend to want to give up on all that God has already done. How many times have we seen people, good people, loving people, walk through those doors, respond? Hear the gospel. Respond to an altar call. Amen. Be, become born again. Start pursuing Jesus. Living a life holy and acceptable to God. Being in discipleship. Growing in faith. And all of a sudden, the cares of the world come in. And when the cares of the world come in, next thing you know, they take their minds and their eyes and their hearts off of God. And they start putting it on all the cares. And all of a sudden, now these cares start to draw them away. This confusion is set in. And now the very thing that they were freed from is the very thing they go back to. Which is my third point. Or my fourth point. Which will be later. They go back to the very thing that they were set free from. They go back to fear. They go back to brokenness. They go back to addiction. They go back to isolation. They go back to loneliness. They go back to making it about money. They go back to making it about the toys. They go back to making it about having fun. They go back, uh, 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 you know, just go back to the world. But Jesus set you free. Why would you want to go back? Why would you want to backslide into a realm of carnality that's going to see you destroyed? Why would you want to do that? Because there's confusion that settles in. And this is dangerous. Because if you're not careful, you'll allow it. And when you allow it, the future that God has planned for you has been derailed by a lie that's taken up its residence in your mind and in your heart. Second Timothy reminds us this. He says, for God did not give us a spirit of what? God did not give us a spirit of fear. That means the spirit came from somewhere else. But he gave us a spirit of power, and of love, and a sound mind. Another translation would say self-control. Look at somebody tell them, control yourself. Now that word sound mind in the Greek is an, industry, it's an interesting combination of words. The word sound is the word sozo, and the word mind, or when put together, is, is, is phrenea. And it's an interesting word because it's a, so phrenea is actually a compound word of sozo and phrenea. And the Greek word sozo, interestingly enough, literally means to be saved, to be rescued, to be delivered, to be revived, to be salvaged and protected, and now is safe and secure. What that word means in the Greek. So if you were literally to unpack it in the English, that's what that word sozo would literally mean to you and I. Let me read it again. To be delivered, to be rescued, to be saved, to be revived, to be salvaged and protected. And now you're safe and secure. The word for nail is another interesting word. The second part of this phrase carries the idea of, of a, of, a, of a person's intelligence or total frame of thinking, including their rational uh, thought, their logic, and their emotions. And this word refers to a mind engaged in, in, in such a way that it comes to accurate and godly conclusions. And so when the word sozo and the word phroneo are compounded into, or compounded into this one word, so for Neo, it pictures the mind that has been delivered. It pictures the mind that has been rescued. It pictures a mind that has been revived, that has been salvaged, and it is now 
protected, safe, and secure. And so if we allow our minds to succumb to fear, as was the case in the days of Timothy, because it was a leader by the name of Nero who wanted to destroy the new work that God was doing in the church. And Timothy was being bombarded. And Timothy and, and the church were being attacked. And Nero was brutal in his persecution. I mean, he was brutal in the way that he would attack the Christians. And so here's Paul the Apostle writing from a prison cell a letter to his son in the faith. And he's saying to this, listen, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And if we read what the, what the Greek literally translates into English, then 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 can literally be read to say this. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And he's given you a mind that has been delivered, a mind that has been rescued, revived and salvaged and protected and brought into a place of safety and security so that it is no longer affected by illogical, unfounded, absurd thoughts. God is with you. And if he is with you, he is for you. And if he is for you, then who can be against you? This is a state of mind. That Timothy wants, or Paul wants Timothy to have. What's the problem? The problem comes in when we're led astray by our flesh. And our flesh has its desire. And its desire is to be opposite of God's plan and God's purpose for our life. And so we allow all these things to be compounded into our Christianity. And so it's hard for us to know what to do when we're feeling all these other things. It, does anybody have any, in front of you guys or behind you guys, there's some books, right? Are there some hymnals or something like, like that right there? Can you just give me like four of them real quick? I, this is your youth pastor me coming out, so forgive me. So just, just give me four books real quick. I don't even know how this is all going to work out, but I think it will. So let's just pretend for just a moment that this is, this is my passion for God. This is my obedience to God. This is my love for God. This is, this is my walk with God. And let's just say that this right here, this is, this is, this is what that represents. Jesus help. And let's just say that this is the cares of the world. Now, we all carry the cares of the world. But sometimes the cares of the world do that. And all of a sudden, we're carrying a weight on us that we're not supposed to carry. It's not for us to carry. In fact, man, I got family issues. And it's just compounding the problem right now. And guess what, Pastor? I got financial issues. And man, I feel the weight of that on my life. And so I got to make decisions that benefit my family. I got to make decisions that benefit our future. And I get that. I'm with you on that. But then, you know what? My flesh desires to not want to follow God anymore. Now, underneath all of this, underneath all of this is the plan of God, the purpose of God, the passion for God, the, the call of God, the anointing of God. And we can't get to it because we're dealing with all of this right here. And what we do is, Pastor, you don't understand. No, no, no. What you fail to recognize is that I do understand. I just don't allow this to live there. This is, this is how I want to live. But the problem is Christians are like, the Pastor, my wife, and Pastor, my kids, and, and Pastor, you know, I don't feel this, and Pastor, I don't feel that. And everything we know to do is being filtered by all of this before it comes to the, what's that ground level? Cornerstone, Christ. And that's what God wants you to do with all that stuff so that you can keep this up here. Take it to the altar. I, I didn't even mean to do that. That was Jesus. Take it to the altar and keep the real thing, the real thing at all times. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying you're not going to feel that. 
I'm not saying you're not going to experience that. I'm not saying you're not going to go through that. But man, cast all your cares. Cast all your cares. Because he cares for you. And keep the cornerstone, the rock, everything that you build your life off of. Keep it free and clear of all that garbage. Why do we want to live with that stuff in our lives? Why do we want to live carrying? It's not yours to carry. It's not ours to carry. But the problem is, oh, but pa- Pastor, I, t- I don't feel like, and, 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 I, and I just think, and, and I'm like, just do this, and you'll be fine. But I feel like I need to do this, and it feels, feels better. It makes me feel good. You know, you know, I, I, I drink because I just I just need to relax. If you need to drink to relax, you have a problem. And the enemy has you confused. Come on, I, I just need to medicate. I need to medicate. I can't handle him. It's just just one little volume pill. It's just you know, I'll be able to deal with him with just one pill. You understand what I'm saying? And, and and we do this to ourselves all the time as human beings. We do it all the time. God doesn't want you to carry any of that stuff. That's why Jesus reminds us, pass it away. Give it to him. Great cares for you. So that you can live free. I don't know about you, but I want to walk in freedom every day of my life. Why would I use this freedom that I have to put myself back into those bondages? That's That's like... It's stupid. Can I go even a little bit further? It's idiotic. Come on. Trust me, I found myself doing idiotic things throughout my life. I I dare say a lot of us have. But we have to look at it and call it out for what it is. Those things are not yours to carry. Most of those things, God's already given you the freedom and the wisdom of how to navigate through. But we rest our hope in our feelings more than we do in Jesus. And so lastly, fourth and finally, confusion propels us toward old bondages. Confusion will propel you to an old bondage. In a long spiritual battle, a person is often pulled back towards negative cycles that they broke free from. The enemy wants to enslave them once again to old bondages. Why? Because if he could discourage you bad enough, if he could hinder you long enough, if he could keep you from pursuing Jesus with everything that's within you, then he could stop you from being effective in God's kingdom. That he could stop you from experiencing the healing that you should already have experienced in your family. Let me just say this. I am one that truly believes that when you become born again, I truly believe that Jesus set you free from every sin that ever had you in captivity. I truly believe that when you are born again, you become brand new. That this old life has gone away, that behold, all things become brand new. My responsibility now is to make sure that I protect that new life. My responsibility now is to make sure that I walk circumspectly of the call of God that's on me. My responsibility is to walk in full submission to Jesus and make sure that I never find myself going back to who I used to be. But here's the problem. There are so many people that are teeter-tottering in their faith. They got one foot in the world and another foot in the kingdom. Sooner or later, that door is going to get shut on you, buddy. Sooner or later, that door is going to get slammed on your face. Because either you're in or you're out. You can't half-heartedly serve God. That's what being lukewarm is all about. It's about doing things your way. And let me remind you, your way got you into the mess that you got in. Paul writes to Titus, is this okay? Titus 2.13, for we continue to look forward to the joy, joyful fulfillment of our hope. In the drawing splendor of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus, the anointed one, he sacrificed himself for us that he might purchase our freedom from every lawless deed to purify himself a people 
a people that are his very own, passionate to do what's beautiful in his eyes. I want to encourage you this morning to stop questioning God's direction and calling that was once so clear. Why isn't it clear anymore? Who has you confused? What has you confused? This is a master tool. Galatians 5.13 reminds us, for you were called to freedom. Brothers, <laughs> only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I love this other translation the way it puts it. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit, but don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up base of operations for the natural realm. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all that we do. So how do I come against confusion in my life? Three quick keys. Three quick keys, and then I'll bring it to a close. In fact, if I could have the worship team come up now. Because when confusion comes in, we have to take authority over confusion by pleading the blood of Jesus on ourselves. Can I tell you that a, a lot of times... A lot of times we wait for somebody to pray for us. You need to pray for yourself. Like, when was the last time you laid hands on yourself? Come on, this is a good thing. Like, sometimes, like, I'm, I start thinking things that I shouldn't think, and I'm like, Jesus, set me free from that. God, I don't want to eat that right now. God, I'm feeling this right now, and it, I don't feel good. God, I, I don't want to feel this. I'll put my hand on my heart. God, I don't want to feel this way anymore. You know, probably, I probably lay hands on myself more than I do on other people. In this sense, that I I pray for myself. Because sometimes, and I know people pray for me, but there's something about me just coming and speaking words of truth out. Speaking words of freedom out. Declaring God's word over my life. God, this mind is subject to you, not subject to the cares of this world. God, this, this thought process God, help me not to think like they do. Help me to think like you do. Just pray for yourself. we got to be proactive. Psalms 119.69 says, Let my cry come before you, O God. Give me understanding according to your word. So, Pastor, what do I do when I'm confused and I feel like life is in disorder? I want to give you three quick things, right? Number one, pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. You know who, who the spirit of truth is? It's God. It's God, the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit of truth. We're um, encouraged to pray in the spirit. We are a spirit-filled church. We believe in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in tongues and interpretation. We believe in the prophetic. We believe in the word of knowledge. We believe in the miracle signs and wonders. We believe that it'll follow. That it'll follow. We believe that the Spirit is subject to us. We believe in the outpouring of His Spirit for the expansion of his kingdom. We believe that wholeheartedly. We believe that. So if I'm going to link hearts with the spirit of truth, not only am I going to study and read his word, but I'm going to pray in the spirit, whether it be in tongues or whether in a, in a, in a known uh, language. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Praying in the spirit brings us out of these times of confusion because when we don't know what to pray, guess who will intercede on our behalf? The spirit. Romans 8.26 reminds us, likewise, the spirit also helps us. In our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Pray without ceasing. Pray for one another. Pray for yourself. Lay hands on your family and believe God with them. Come on. Isaiah 59 19 reminds us that the enemy comes in like a flood. But the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard or a barrier of opposition against him. So I just believe what the Bible says. Secondly, we need to be proactive. And, and number one, when you're confused, 
Don't trust yourself. You're the last person you should trust. Don't trust you. Trust God radically. Even when you don't feel like it. Ever been there? Oh, I don't know how I'm going to give this, but I just know, God, you're telling me to do it. And then you see God just do a miracle. Powerful. God, I don't don't know how this is all going to work out, but I just believe that that if I come together in agreement with my spouse, that we're going to see this take take place. Come together in his will, in agreement, and God moves on your behalf. Just going to trust God radically. When's the last time you trusted God radically? Just radical in your trust for God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Don't lean unto your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Philippians 4, 8 says, So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic, real, honorable, admirable, beautiful, respectful, pure, and holy, merciful, and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. And lastly, hold on to his word. Just hold on to his word. Why do, you, why do you think RLU was birthed? Because if we can get the word of God in you, you can have the promises of God resonating through you. The word of God never comes back void. It never comes back void. So RLU is an important class for all new believers and even mature believers to take. Because a lot of times, if we're not careful, we can get a little skewed in our theology. We can get a little bit messed up in our thinking. And we need good teachers that are in it day in and day out to help us get back on track. Can anybody say amen? Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, as since members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. I love this. I just believe that I've been called to live in peace. Now that doesn't mean that I'll always experience peace the way the world thinks peace is. Nothing's happening. Nothing's wrong. Everything's kumbaya. No, I could have peace in the midst of all the drama, in the midst of when Jesus was sleeping in the middle of the storm, he wasn't afraid of the storm. Why? Because he was the very peace of God himself. He had peace. Paul had peace. While he was locked up, while he was on trial for, for, uh, to be, to, to be uh, put to death, he had peace. That kind of peace that I want to have in the middle of, of all the struggle, in the middle of all the drama. You know, last night, I just want to share this and I'll close with you. Last night, uh, nine of us took a boat out to go uh, diving for lobster because we're too cheap to go to the store and buy it. Just kidding. And uh, my daughter was with me and it was eight other guys. And um, we went out. It's just a crazy night because it's a beautiful night. A lot of boats out there. A lot of guys fishing with nets and you don't know this guys that fish with nets for lobster and guys that die for lobster, two totally different animals and uh, getting cussed out and, uh, you know, threatening to run us over and all this kind of this stupid stuff. Um, but it was towards the end of the night. I think we were in the water for four hours. I think it was like four hours. And my legs were like gone. My daughter and, and, and uh, one of the guys from our church, they took off down the wall this way. And uh, six of the guys, seven of the guys, six of the guys went the other way. And I was supposed to be behind my daughter and, and uh, her dive buddy. And I got consumed and I was just looking for, for lobsters. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I came up and I looked for Justine and for Rick and they were gone. Like they were gone. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I turned around looking for the boat and the boat was gone. And then we looked for the other divers, and they were gone. And I was all out there by myself. It was kind of weird. And it was interesting because I found myself by myself, and right now I'm getting in trouble. That's why I'm not looking at Roxanne, because I just feel laser beams just kind of hitting me right now. But, but I sat there, and I, I felt like I'm in the, in the middle of nowhere in, in water, in a wetsuit, goggles, you know, guys threatening to run us over and kill us with their boats. And nobody's around. It's like nobody. My legs started to get tired and weary. And I'm like, and I'm exhausted. It's been a long night. And then I, I, I dove, I dove one more time and, 
and I don't know, between five and ten feet, I saw something. I saw something in the water, and I, I, had, I had my daughter bring it because I was all by myself. And then I dove down, and, and then I found this in the rocks. I wasn't alone anymore. I kid you not, I found it like almost 10 feet down, I think. And, and I, saw, I saw it in the rocks. I was like, what is that? I pulled it out. And I was like, because I was alone, right? And I saw, and it reminded me of the Tom Hanks movie, right? And I was like, I found Wilson. I found Wilson. I'm not alone. Shut up, devil, you're a liar. <laughs> and I, I sat there, and my legs were so tired that I just sat, I, I, I got up on the jetty, and I just sat on the rocks, and I sat there, and I thought to myself, in my head, I had that thought, I'm by myself. What if nobody finds me? What if, what if they start freaking out and start looking for me in the wrong place? You know, what if, what if Coast Guard, you know, that's going to be embarrassing, all this stuff. What if Roxanne comes looking for me? That's going to be bad. <laughs> But if you know my wife, she'll find me. She will find me. And uh, and then I just sat there for a moment. And I said, you know what? I'm not alone. God's always with me. And I just closed my eyes. And there was this old third day song. Because there was just this beautiful sky with stars everywhere. And there was that song that goes, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Remember that song? You are holy. And I just started singing that song, and I felt the presence of God just there with me. And I just got real happy. I was like, me and Wilson are kicking it. And I'm like, they'll come and pick me. They'll find me in like 10 minutes. No. 20 minutes? No. About a half an hour passed by, and I'm like, okay, this is getting serious. So I just decided, okay, I'm just going to swim back towards where I knew the boat was. And I just started, you know, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And I just kept on kicking towards the direction. Sure enough, in the distance, I see a little red light, a little green light, letting me know a boat's coming my way. And I'm thinking, if that's a boat that wants to harm us, I rebuke that boat. Sink it, Lord, in the name of God. I'm just kidding. But it was, it, was our, it was our taxi. He came and picked me up. And I just, just remembered that when I was preaching these first two services, that no matter what you go through, even when you feel alone, you're never alone. God's always there with you. And you're just one prayer away from being in the midst of his divine presence. And so you don't have to go through life isolated or by yourself or through the struggles or the battles or through all that stuff that you carry. Don't allow confusion to steer you away from your pursuit of Jesus. Never allow the confusing thoughts to cause you to walk away from the grace and the mercy that God showed you when he died on that cross and rose again on the third day so that you could be restored into a right relationship in freedom with the Father. Thank you for joining us today. It's such an honor to have you listen to the gospel message through Restoration Life. If this message blessed you, leave a comment. If God's put it on your heart to leave a donation, then do so. But we just really pray that you take everything that you heard today and you apply it to your life. God bless you. Have an amazing week.